Hi everybody, it's Adam with heartvalvesurgery.com and this is a special surgeon question and answer session all about mitral valve surgery. I'm thrilled to share that our guest speaker today is Dr. Vaughn Starnes, who is the chair of the Department of Surgery and Surgeon in Chief at Keck Medicine of USC in Los Angeles, California. During his extraordinary career, Dr. Starnes has helped many patients with heart valve disease, including children like Max Page and celebrities who are also governors like Arnold Schwarzenegger. At heartvalvesurgery.com, Dr. Starnes has been an absolute champion. As you probably know, he has many, many, many patient success stories. And yes, over 14 years ago, Dr. Starnes performed a double successful heart valve surgery on me. I'd like to bring him into the call. Dr. Starnes, are you there? Thank you so much for that uh, intro, and I, I appreciate all the, the compliments that you're giving me. It's, it's been my pleasure and will continue to be my pleasure to take, pay, ter, take care of patients with heart valve disease. And so Dr. Starnes, mitral valve surgery, I understand it is one of your specialties. Can you talk a little bit about why you chose that to be a, a very important part of your practice? Mitral valve surgery to me uh, allows a lot of creativity. You know, Adam, I'm a, also a congenital heart surgeon and every day when I'm doing congenital heart surgery, it's like doing plastic surgery. It's a little like opening up gifts on Christmas morning. You don't know exactly what you're going to, what you're going to get. So mitral valve surgery is a little like that. You know, you see an echo, you think you know what you're going to see when you open the, the chest, but sometimes it's a little different. Uh, and it's the functional valve. It's not a static valve. It requires uh, a certain methodology of repairing it to make it functional and gives patients long-term uh, quality of life. Yeah, and so maybe to help patients who are either newly diagnosed or are going through the treatment selection process, let's step back and maybe talk about why a patient may actually need their valve fixed. What are the symptoms? What are the causes and potential risks for patients? In America today, most of the mitral valve disease is actually mitral regurgitation, not mitral stenosis. You know, years back, sort of the turn of the century when we had strep uh, infections, mitral stenosis from rheumatic heart disease was common, but not so much anymore. So patients today will end up seeing their physician for mitral regurgitation. The symptoms of that are often leg swelling, shortness of breath, difficulty with mild exercise, like climbing maybe a flight of stairs. Uh, they may develop arrhythmias. They may develop what they would say fluttering of the heart. Uh, these are all signs and symptoms of pretty advanced mitral valve disease. And when you talk about mitral valve disease, what I've learned over the years is the idea of valve progression or the disease progressing. Can you talk about what a patient may go through as the valve condition gets worse? The biggest problem we have with progressive mitral disease, mitral regurgitation in particular, is that we get left ventricular dilation, decreasing left ventricular function or heart function leading to heart failure, and a dilation of your atrium. And as your atria dilate, you can get into irregular heartbeats, irregular rhythms like atrial fibrillation. Atrial fibrillation that's periodic, that is you're in atrial fibrillation one moment, sinus rhythm the next moment, leads you to a risk of stroke because clot formation in the atria. So what you wanna do is prevent atrial fibrillation from occurring. So progressive mitral regurgitation or mitral disease leading to that can be a real problem because once you've got atrial fibrillation, as anyone would know who has that disease, it's very difficult to treat. Sometimes multiple meds, blood thinners, ablations, and then maybe finally surgical ablation with the repair of the valve. What exactly is a mitral valve repair and why might it be advantageous for patients? Well, a mitral valve repair is where we go in and we actually do not replace your valve. That's the simplest explanation to start with. The mitral valve's got two big leaflets. Uh, usually it's the posterior leaflet that's involved with the disease process. And strangely enough, 80% of that is in the central portion of that leaflet. Just backtracking a little bit, the mitral valve is a functional valve. It doesn't open and close by pressure differential. 
it's actually attached to the heart with strings and papillary muscles. And sometimes those strings break. The leaflet prolapse is like a parachute that has strings cut on it. So when those strings break loose, the valve leaks uh, in that location. So we can either go back and resect that portion of the broken strings, or we can add new strings in that location. And after doing so, we then add a support band to support the entire uh, reparative process. Now, why we would we do that? Number one, we think a repair will last as long or maybe longer than what we have to compare it to, which would be a pig valve or a cow valve. Number two, we think by having that uh, functional apparatus intact, the strings, the papillary muscles all intact, it preserves the function of the heart better than replacing the valve. So those are the important points, I believe, in repairing a heart valve. Great points about the advantages of mitral valve repair, Dr. Starnes. When might patients need a mitral valve replacement? Uh, mitral valve replacement on echo. You can sit with a patient and sort of say, this valve is not repairable because it could be stenotic. It could have calcium in it. Uh, particularly calcification in annuals can be a problem for some repairs. Uh, you've got bileaflet involvement in an elderly patient. More importantly, you may have coronary artery disease in causing what we call ischemic mitral disease. There is a recent study, not so recent anymore, but where it showed really that if you try to repair those ischemic mitrals, a lot of those come back for replacement. So if I got a patient that's 65 years of age or greater and has got ischemic mitral, I will often recommend to that patient that a more durable repair is a valve replacement. If I got a lady who's got a big lot of calcium in the annulus and out on the leaflets, I'm just going to tell them up front, the best long-term solution for you is a valve replacement. So Dr. Starnes, can we talk about the different types of valve replacement devices available to patients who do need a replacement? What, what can you tell the patients out there about uh, mechanical valves? Yes, a, a mechanical valve is a valve that's uh, been around for years and it's a very durable valve. Uh, the only downside is uh, it requires you to be on a blood thinner. And in the mitral position, it re requires you to be on quite a bit. Whereas in the aortic position, you can, you can take less blood thinner and the valve remains functional. So a lot of people, when they see their cardiologist or their surgeon and say they're in less than 50 years of age, a mechanical valve is often recommended to them because they're young and a tissue valve at their age may only last 10 or 12 years. So there would be susceptible to repeated operations. So a mechanical valve is often the valve that is recommended for a younger person with mitral valve disease. Dr. Starnes, I, I, I imagine that there's a lot of different types of um, mechanical valves out there. Is there any one in particular that you've used and you've seen as a, a durable um, device that, that um, has helped your patients throughout the years? Adam, there's uh, basically two mechanical valves out there uh, that uh, that are you being used? Most of both of them are by leaflet. One is by Abbott, and uh, the other is just blocking on the name of it, but it's a by leaflet valve. The uh, the valve, of course, I use is the St. Jude valve. It's been in the marketplace for over 30 years. It's a very durable valve. It works well, and it's my valve of choice when I'm putting in a mechanical valve. So on the, the flip side of mechanical, Dr. Starnes, I understand there are the biological or tissue valves. Can you talk about those options that are available to patients as well? Sure. Uh, when you talk about tissue valves, you're mainly talking about pig valves or porcine valves or bovine or cow valves. Uh, cow valves are mainly made from the heart sac of the cow, pericardium. And of course, the pig valves are pig valves. Uh, over the years, uh, I've been looking at the types of valves in various positions. I've been at this now almost 30 years. And what I've seen is that, believe it or not, I use a pericardial valve mainly in the aortic position. And I use mainly the porcine valve in the mitral position. My rationale for that is that in the mitral position, the pericardial valves tend to get a little stiffer quicker 
they develop a gradient, I believe, quicker. So I have found that the porcine valve dysfunctions better in the mitral position than the pericardial valve. So I've been a, a mainstay porcine valve user in the mitral position for probably 20 plus years. Dr. Starnes, the, the patients in our community, if there's one thing I know about them, um, they love great surgical results and they have a fascination with technology. Um, I have heard that there are some of these new technologies where some of these valves are actually coated with certain types of chemicals to prevent future calcification. Is that, is that something you're uh, familiar with or have you seen that actually play out during your career as, as another advantage for, for certain types of valves? Uh, that's a great point, uh, Adam. I think there are surface coatings now that really have increased the durability and particularly on the porcine valve. I know every, every company's got its own proprietary way of preventing early calcification. And basically that is a technology where they, they hide the aldehyde molecules that prevent and hopefully prevent calcium from attracting to them. So it's really the glutaraldehyde that we, the, we tan the, the pericardium in or the porcine in that is the radicals that stick out that calcium wants to bind to. So all these new technologies are really focused on preventing calcium bindings to these molecules on the surface of these valves. And that technology has really worked out very well. And I do believe it's increased the durability of these valves. Yeah, and so in addition to the technology, there's the whole next generation, it seems like, of valvular therapy, which I, I know you and your team at USC have been a big part of the research. And that is the transcatheter technologies for mitral valve therapy. I've heard a lot about mitral valve repair using devices like the MitraClip. How has that helped your patients there at USC? Well, there's a lot of transcatheter technologies if you introduce. There's actually valve replacement technology now with catheter-based uh, technology. What that has really done is it has allowed us to expand care to patients that would otherwise be high risk for surgery. Uh, say patients got a 20 or 30% risk for a complication or even, even death with surgery with mitral valve disease. We can offer mitral clip or even transcatheter valve if the clip is not appropriate to these patients. So we've expanded the ability to offer a intervention for their mitral disease that may not involve the rigors of surgery opening the chest and obviously the postoperative recovery. Yeah, and maybe to contextualize for the patients listening, you talk about the rigors of surgery versus transcatheter and the fact that these patients who are at high risk, they do not need to have their sternum, uh, no incision to the sternum, I think no incision to the ribs. Are there any other advantages that patients might want to know about a transcatheter approach and, and what their recoveries might be like compared to surgical? Yeah, with a transcatheter approach, I think the biggest advantage is they don't have to be on the heart-lung machine. Uh, the incision is an issue, not a biggest issue is I think the risk of an elderly patient, particularly with vascular disease, going on a heart-lung machine with the intended risk of stroke. Uh, it's just one of the things that we do with surgery that we need. It's a device we can't get around. So if we can avoid that in an elderly patient, that may already have some complications, high surgical risk. That's the biggest thing that we get around with our transcatheter therapies, and that's huge. A patient that gets a transcatheter clip, a mitral clip, actually can go home the next day. And it's just, it's remarkable the how we can offer some benefit without giving the long postoperative recovery that would be necess necessitated by someone that may have surgery for that same process. I would just add for patients, there is, if you would, a menu of things that out there are out there. And there's no one particular one that is best. It's, it's what's best for your particular circumstance. If you're a good surgical risk and you've got a mitral valve prolapse or a regurgitation, your best option is a surgical repair. If you're elderly and got a high high risk for surgery, your best chance is with a mitral clip or even a transcatheter mitral replacement. 
So it's important that you go to, I think, a heart valve center where you have cardiologists and surgeons both looking at your case and to give you great advice about what's best for you. And I think also, Adam, you're doing a great service to the general population by putting the information out there that they know what, what's, what they could select from and how to choose from it. Cool. Well, thanks so much for the kind words, Dr. Starnes, but I've got to thank you even more for that advice. Because I got to tell you, the last question I was going to ask you is what's your number one piece of advice? But I think you just shared about five or six great pieces of advice. So I want to thank you so much for really uh, uh, distinctly helping the patients understand what their mindset may want to go through as they get ready for a, a very significant procedure in their life. And so with that, I guess we can wrap this up. Thanks so much for your time, Dr. Starnes. Thanks so much for all the great things you're doing there at USC. And um, again, I just can't thank you enough for everything that, that you and your, your team is doing. Thank you. Adam, it's been wonderful to be with you and thank you very much.